Welcome to the Media Library of First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas. We hope and pray you receive a blessing from today's message. First Baptist Church of Troy is a Christ-centered, family-friendly church which offers activities for kids, teens, and adults. You can learn more and contact us by visiting fbctroytx.org. Now, here's today's message. All right, so um, mission trip is Wednesday, all right? And so today we are going to pray for our mission team. But before we do, we're going to open our Bibles. And this is something God put on my mind, oh, probably a couple of weeks ago or so, is that we're going to examine some biblical passages where the Apostle Paul specifically asks people to pray for missions, to pray that the gospel will go forward, because I think it's a good idea. That if we're going to pray together over our mission team, and if we're going to pray over missions, it's a good idea to look in the Bible and ask the question, has anyone who wrote inspired scripture ever prayed over missions before? Because we could probably learn something about how we should pray from those biblical passages. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Let me open our time in the Word together with prayer, and then we'll dive in. Father, we bow our heads before you our faithful God, our loving Father. We want to ask you to teach us this morning. Uh, Lord, your Holy Spirit is our teacher, and those of us who know Christ as Savior, we have the Spirit, and He is the one who guides us into all truth. And I pray that you'd help us to listen this morning. And God, that as we look in the Bible that you have given to us, Lord, that teaches us who you are and how you want us to live. I pray that you would give us hearts to soak up what we learn and to put it into practice this week. And I pray in Jesus' name these things, amen. Um, how many of you have ever prayed for something before? Show of hands. How many of you have ever prayed for something and it never happened? How many of you prayed for something and it did happen? How many of you have ever wondered, how could I know how to pray prayers that God would answer? You ever think about that? Because, you know, you only have so much time in a day, right? You've only got so much time to pray. Wouldn't it be great if you could streamline your praying so that all of those things that you might have asked for that God would just go, no, not going to do that. You could just not even pray for those things <laughs> and not waste that time. And you could pray instead for things that God would go, I'm into that. That would be a good thing to know. Well, good news. You can learn, and I can learn, to pray the kinds of prayers that God will answer. Now, there's still some question marks there. His timing on his answers, the exact way he might choose to answer. But we can learn to pray the kinds of prayers that reflect God's Word, that reflect God's heart. And when we pray that way, we will see more answers than if we don't pray that way. And I want to take that concept and apply it to our praying for our mission team as we look at these passages this morning. First of all, turn to John chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Fourth book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 15. And uh, we're going to look at, a, at a, it's incredible. This, this John 15, if you ever wanted to memorize a chapter in the Bible, I think this is the one. John chapter 15. This is in the upper room. Jesus is going to be arrested in just a short amount of time and taken to the cross to be crucified. This is his last before he's crucified teaching to his disciples. It's what he wants them to know. And in John 15, he talks about this relationship that we need to have with him. And he uses the illustration of the vine and the branches. A, a vine, a grapevine, that grows branches from which fruit is supposed to be produced. And um, he's telling them, and I guess kind of sum it, verse 4 in John, John 15, Remain in me, and I will remain in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. So Jesus is telling his men, and he would tell us today, the key to a fruitful life is remain, some of your translations might say, abide in me. You must cultivate, and I must cultivate that close relationship with Jesus Christ, through His Word and through prayer and through time with Him, if we're going to have a fruitful life. That is the key that unlocks the door to bearing fruit for the Lord Jesus. Now, 
He's going to go on down. I want us to look at verses, um, uh, starting in verse, uh, verses 7 through 8. Skip on down to verse 7. If, <clears throat> now you see the word if, what does that word tell us? If, a choice that, there's a condition going on here. If, if sentences that start with if, usually have always actually have a condition involved with them. So Jesus says, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. Wow, that kind of sounds like a blank check from Jesus to just ask him, and he'll do whatever I want. Remember, he started the sentence with if. So there's a couple of conditions, but it is a blank check. For, check this out, verse 8, my father is honored by this, that you bear much fruit, showing that you are my disciples. So in this context where Jesus is talking about this close relationship that he wants us to cultivate with him, he's telling us, he says, if you will remain in me, the, that word just means to, to abide in, to, it could be used to go inside of a house. He said, if you will stay closely connected to me. And he said, if my words remain in you, my words in the Bible remain in you. He said, then ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. So just in a nutshell, what we see here is that Jesus says, as you cultivate a close relationship with me daily, abiding in me, remaining in me, spending time with me, praying, reading your Bible, getting closer and closer to me, as my words find a dwelling place in your heart, so that your thinking about how to live life begins to be transformed so that it begins to reflect my word rather than your selfish pursuits. He said, then you're in a position to pray the kinds of prayers that I want to answer. And this is pretty profound. And he says, my father will be honored when this happens. When we are growing in our relationship with Christ and we are seeing things with a different perspective because to remain in Christ this way, you cannot stay the same. To connect with Jesus' word this way, I cannot stay the same. And as I begin to be transformed and experience that change in my life, my desires will begin to change. The things that I will pray for will begin to change. Why? Because I am beginning to see things from God's perspective. And what changes my outlook? Remaining in Christ and His words remaining in me. And when that change begins to happen, the way that I pray, the things that I pray for, begin to change. And they begin to reflect the heart of God. And Jesus says, when that starts happening in your life, and when that begins to grow, you're going to see some answers to some prayers. And some things to pray for are going to occur to you that probably never would have had you not stayed closely connected to me, had you not given my word a home in your heart. And when it happens, he said, my father is going to be honored. He is going to be held in high regard. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to be praying for things, and it's going to happen. And you're going to go, whoa, God does answer prayers. This is awesome. And you're going to tell somebody, and they're going to go, what? I would never have prayed for that. Wow, look what God did. And his Father in heaven will be glorified. And what's going to happen when we begin to grow and change this way? Our lives are going to bear fruit. Our lives are going to bear the kinds of things that make people go, Oh, that, that, that's amazing. Because we did it? No. Because the living God accomplished it as we stayed connected with Christ and gave His Word a home in our heart, got on our knees before God, and called out to Him in prayer over things that would never have occurred to us before. I promise you that if you will do what Jesus said here, it will change the way that you pray. There have been times when I have needed to pray over something and I've come before the Lord, and I've just thought, man, I, don't, I just don't know how to pray over this. Spend some time in the Word, wait patiently, trying to listen to the Lord, and I'm telling you, a thought will come into my mind about how I need to pray for it, and I would never have come up with it. 
And I have prayed for some things that I would not probably have prayed for when I have done this. Now, I don't always do this. <laughs> I still, there are times I pray for things and I just go, you know, Chris, that's probably about your agenda and not God's. But as we grow in our walk with the Lord by doing what Jesus said right here, we will pray differently. And we have his promise that prayers will be answered. Go on down to verse 16 and 17, same chapter. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that remains, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. This command I give to you, love one another. So it's interesting that answers to prayer are found in the same context where Jesus talks about our lives bearing the kind of fruit that glorifies God. Turn over to Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 27. Romans 8, 26 through 27. Romans chapter 8, 26 through 27. In the same way, the Spirit, now Spirit should be capitalized in your translation right there. Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how we should pray. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes on behalf of the saints according to God's will. Now, in John 15, Jesus taught us that the key to praying the kinds of prayers that God wants to answer is our connection with Christ, cultivating that relationship with Him, giving His Word in the Bible a home in our hearts so that we experience some transformation and we pray differently. Romans 8 tells us, guess what? Sometimes we just don't know how we should pray. Why? Because we're not God. I don't know everything, and neither do you. I can look at a need in someone's life and go, I think I know how to pray for them. But you know what? I really don't. I really don't. Because I don't know exactly what God wants to do with that need in their life. A great and easy illustration, usually when someone is experiencing sickness, pain, or suffering, what do we immediately ask God to do? What? Heal them, take it away, make them better. What if God doesn't want to do that? Do you think God is going to answer my prayer to heal them, take it away, or make it better? No. And you're like, that just doesn't even sound right. That's true. Think about the Apostle Paul. He had what he described as a thorn in his flesh, a tormentor of the devil. That's, you know. He said, I prayed earnestly three times. Earnestly means he's on his face crying out to the Lord at three different occasions, pleading that God will remove that thorn from his flesh. And he said, God told me no. Because sometimes God says no. Because God had something higher and grander in mind than simply easing Paul's suffering. Because Paul went on to say, he said, when I am weak, when I am hurting, when I am struggling, then I am at my strongest because the power of God in me is more clearly displayed. And experienced. Sometimes, like he said in chapter 8, we don't know how we, how we should pray. In the context right here in Romans 8, Paul's talking about suffering. He's talking about the difficulty that we experience in life. And he says, you know what? In our sufferings and our difficulties, we just don't know how to pray. Our immediate reaction is, Lord, take it away. This is uncomfortable and I don't like it. But that may not be what God chooses to do. So what does God do? His Holy Spirit who lives in believers, <clears throat> He helps us in our weakness. He's right there to help us. For we do not know how we should pray, but the Holy Spirit Himself intercedes for us. He goes before the Father and He prays for you. 
and he prays for me. Did you, did you know that? That the Holy Spirit himself, and later on in Romans 8, we find that Jesus is doing the same thing. The Holy Spirit of God and God the Son, Jesus Christ, are before the Father praying for you and for me. That's incredible. It goes on, he says, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Who is he who searches our hearts right there? Who does that have to be? It's God. And God, who searches our hearts, he knows it all. He knows the mind of the Spirit because he and the Spirit are one. Because the Spirit is interceding on behalf of the saints, look at this, according to God's will. I don't always know how to pray for myself or others, but I know someone who does. And that's the Holy Spirit. He, God knows my heart. The Father knows the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit is interceding for me and for you in perfect harmony with the will of the Father. That is powerful. So when you have a time in your life and you're just like, I just don't know how to pray, you need to follow it up by saying, but, Father, I know your Spirit's praying for me. And I know your Son is praying for me. And I'm going to rest in that. And I'm going to trust you to help me discover how I need to pray in this. And I will wait for you to show me what I need to pray. Because I want to pray the kind of prayers that you want to answer. He goes on, and of course this is where Romans 8.28 is. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purposes. Isn't that great? That, that is the most taken out of context verse in the entire Bible, right there. But the context before and after are huge. Because the context before says, man, I don't know how to pray. I'm struggling. I don't even know what to ask God for. But the Holy Spirit's praying for me. And you know what? He prays in perfect harmony with the will of my Father who loves me perfectly. And I know that this is going to work out for good in my life because of my God. See, when you start connecting those dots, it's really powerful. It isn't that God just works it all out. It's that His Holy Spirit has come before His throne on your behalf and mine, and He is asking the Father to do this. The Son is doing the same thing. You have two powerful prayer partners in your life. And so do I. And it's pretty awesome. Two things to pull from these passages. Number one, from John 15, as I, as I remain connected to Christ and as I give His Word a home in my heart, the kinds of things I am going to pray for will change so that I more often am praying in harmony with God's will. From Romans 8, when I have no idea how to pray, and there are times because I'm ignorant as a human being. I don't know what tomorrow holds. There are times when I don't know how to pray, but I can trust that God's Holy Spirit does know how to pray for me. And He is praying for me. And His Son is praying for me. And I can wait patiently knowing that it is covered. And when God opens the eyes of my heart to see what I need to see, then I can join Him in that. And until He does, I will wait. Now, if we apply these two concepts to our praying for our mission trip. I've been, there's some things I've been praying for, but I don't know what's going to happen <clears throat> in Honduras. I have no idea. I had a passing thought today as I remembered when Bubba went to the Dominican Republic and all his, lo all his luggage got lost and he had to wear like these long bright red beachcomber shorts and look like a real tourist over there in the DR and he's got a look on his face like, yeah, I'm still not over it. But uh, I just thought, oh Lord, I hope that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> you know, but you don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I might have some bright red shorts on, you know, just below my knees, look like I'm, you know, Payne Stewart going to head out to the Masters or something, you know, 25 years ago or whatever. <clears throat> we don't know exactly what will happen. But there are some things in the Bible that we can pray that God would do where the Apostle Paul says, hey, you people wherever, pray for this for the going forth of the gospel. The first one I want to look at, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And you know what? I've got these up on the screen. Hang on just a second. We can figure this out. There we go. All right. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. It's over in your New Testament, right after 1 Thessalonians, which is a really good place for it to be. 
<clears throat> this is kind of a brand new Bible, and all the pages are stuck together. I'm really struggling this morning. <laughs> You grab a hunk of pages and you're all the way to Revelation. So, uh, all right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says this, Finally pray for us, brothers and sisters, that the Lord's message may spread quickly and be honored as in fact it was among you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil people. For not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And we are confident about you in the Lord, that you are both doing and will do what we are commanding. Now may the Lord direct your hearts toward the love of God and the endurance of Christ. Real quickly, Paul is writing to the people in Thessalonica, and he says, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray some specific things. He starts off, he asks for prayer. The first thing that he asks for, he says, pray that the word of the Lord will spread quickly. Paul knows there are lost people everywhere. And he's one guy. And he's trying to get to all these places. And he has this burden of lost people on his heart every day. And he says, pray. Ask God to cause the word to spread fast. Like a, like a sprinter going forth. He says, pray that the word of the Lord will spread quickly. Second, pray that the word of the Lord will be honored as it was among you. When Paul was in Thessalonica, you can go back over and uh, I think it's Acts chapter 16 is when he was at Thessalonica. Don't quote me on the number, but I think that's right. He went there, and the first thing he did, he goes to the synagogue, he proclaims the gospel to the Jews. Some of them were like, hey, that's pretty cool. We're in. And the rest of them were like, that is not pretty cool. We are not in, and we are going to make your life stink, man. And they tried. But a large number of Gentiles believed in the gospel, and a church was born in Thessalonica. And he says, pray that right here where I am, that the gospel, that the word about Christ from the Lord would be held in high regard, that it would be honored, that where people hear about this message about Jesus Christ, they would go, oh, hey, I've heard about that. Those, those people are something else. They're the real deal. There's something real going on there. I respect that. He said, pray that it would be honored. Third, he, say, he, he, he says, pray that me and my associates here would be delivered from perverse, evil, unbelieving people. Ooh, they had some opposition. Some of those Jews, when he was in Thessalonica, and you can go read about it, they hounded him there. He went to the next town over. They followed into that town and started making trouble for him. He said, pray that God would deliver us from these people. And he says, not everyone is in the faith or not everyone has faith. Man, one of the things to pray for is deliverance from those people who are just perverse, they're evil, they're twisted, and oppose the gospel message. Now, I don't know if we'll encounter anybody in Honduras like that, but there are people like that all over this world. They hate the message of Jesus. They hate Christianity. They want nothing to do with it, and they don't want anybody else to have anything to do with it. And so something to pray. God, deliver from those kinds of people. So that's his, those are his requests. He expresses down in, uh, in, in verse 3, confidence in God's faithfulness to protect and strengthen the people as they pray. He says he's confident because God is faithful. He's going to strengthen and protect them. And we find the source of the opposition. He will strengthen and protect you in verse 3 from what? The evil one. Who do you think that is? The devil, yep. And way back in Ephesians 6, we learned that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms and so forth and so on. Satan and his demons. And all of that mess that they've got going on. So we find out that the opposition is from the devil. But he says, God is faithful. 
and he's going to hear your prayers, and he's going to, he's going to guard us. He expresses his confidence down in verse 4. We are confident about you in the Lord. He expresses his confidence in the Thessalonians and in the believers' faithfulness to Christ. Uh, they had been faithful to the Lord, and they had obeyed the commands that God had given them. And then he expresses a desire that God would direct their hearts toward love and obedience. The things to pray for here, and we're going to have all of these at the end when we sum this up, but prayer that the word of the Lord would spread quickly, that it would be honored and held in high regard, and that those who are out sharing the gospel, that God would protect them from perverse, evil people. Three things right there Paul asks for. Turn over to the book of Colossians. Back the other direction in your Bible, just a couple of books over. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. This is probably my favorite of these passages where Paul is asking people to pray. Starting in verse 2, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 4, says this, Be devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray for us too that God may open a door for the message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I might make it known as I should. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunities let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how to answer everyone. So, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul right here is writing to the Colossians. He's asking them to pray. First, he says, I need you to do something, Colossians. And he would say to us today if he was here. I need you to devote yourself to prayer. Now, this is not like, I'm going to pray twice a week and cover it. This is like, I need you to give your soul to praying now. And don't stop. Devote yourself to this. So right at the outset of this one, we see that this is a heavy hitter request because he wants them to give their time, their energy, their heart, their focus to praying. And he says, praying, keeping alert, being watchful in your prayers with thanksgiving so he's asking for a kind of prayer here that first of all it's devoted we're not going to stop it's watchful man i'm my head's on a swivel and i'm watching for whatever needs i can see that need prayer and it's accompanied with thanksgiving thanksgiving for what god will do as he answers the prayers that paul is asking them to pray because this is the kind of a prayer that god wants to answer look at it real quick he says, first of all, in verse 3, pray for us too that God may open a door for the message so we can proclaim the mystery of Christ. What a great, simple thing to pray over, over our mission trip. God in heaven, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are going to do in Honduras as you are at work in those people and with our mission team. Thank you, God, for going before them. I pray that you would open doors for the gospel in Honduras that are not already open. Because that's what, when you've got to open a door, it's because it's closed, right? So we can throw that not already open in there. I pray that you would open doors for the gospel to be proclaimed that are not even open yet in places no one would think about. What a great thing to pray. That's what Paul asked for. Do you think God wants to answer that prayer? Boy, I do. You think God wants to hear people to hear the good news about His Son? I think He does. So pray that open a door so that we can proclaim the mystery of Christ. The next thing, he says, pray that I would make it known in verse 4, as I should. God in heaven, please help our team in Honduras and Osvaldo and and all of those people there, our brothers and sisters in Christ, please help them to proclaim the good news because that's what they should do. Give them the strength, the doors open, the courage, the skill, the opportunities, and help them to proclaim it because that's what we should do. So here, devote yourself to praying with thanksgiving. Pray that God would open a door so the gospel can be shared and pray that those who are there to, to share it 
would do so. It's so simple, I'm going to move on. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Galatians, Ephesians, right before Philippians, which is right before Colossians. If, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Paul has just finished in this context talking about spiritual warfare, who our battle is really against. Here's what he says in verse uh, 18 through 20. <clears throat> With every prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. In the Holy Spirit, that is. And to this end, be alert with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. Pray for me, that I may be given the right words when I begin to speak, that I may confidently make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may be able to speak boldly as I ought to speak. The things Paul asked for here, first, that God would give him the right words when he would speak. Pray that God would give me the words. You know, sometimes we're in a situation where maybe there is a specific word that someone needs, a specific presentation of the gospel, a specific part of the gospel. I was a fun story. I've told it before. Maybe you remember or not, but um, had a professor in school who was our evangelism prof, and he would do a, a hospital chaplaincy so that he could have opportunities to share the gospel in the hospital so he took this guy along with him one time who said man i really want to go with you i want to learn how to share the gospel with people i'd love to go with you and so he's like okay yeah yeah all right come on so there was this one old codger that was in this hospital room that he had been going in and been talking to and the guy was just mean and nasty and did not want to hear anything about the lord didn't want to be prayed for had barely tolerated um, this uh, professor that I had going in there to talk to him. So he said, okay, he said, I'm going to... So he said, well, I, he can't mess this up. <laughs> you know? And so he says, okay, so this is Mr. So-and-so. And he said, come on in. And he said, I'm, you take the lead on this one. And so he said, I had been kind of trying to just be gentle with this guy and just to present the gospel in kind of a roundabout way. I didn't want to offend him, you know, any worse than he already was. And he, so he said, I walk in with this fella. And the guy just looks at him. He says, Mr. So-and-so, do you know if you die today, you're going straight to hell? And he said, I was like, you can't do that. You can't share the gospel with people that way. Oh my gosh, it's over. The guy's going to die and be in the lake of fire forever. And he said, that grouchy old dude, he just looked back at him. Yes, I do. And the guy said, would you like to ask Jesus to be your Savior today? Yes, I would. And he prayed to trust Christ right there. God, give me the words to say. Because I don't know a person's heart and their life experience and where they've been. I don't know what they need. Yeah, they need the gospel. But God, when I'm sharing with someone, would you give me the words to say? Because they may need something that I would not think of. Because you know all things, Lord. And you are at work in their life. And you have been at work in their life. And I'm just joining you here. And I have no idea what you've done. So I'm not going to be such a moron that I should just charge in like Light Horse Harry, knowing exactly what they need. I'm going to pause and say, God, will you give me the words? And then I'm going to trust by faith that you will. That's what Paul's asking for. Just pray that God would help me know what to say. The second thing, pray that, he would con that I would confidently make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray that I would share the gospel with confidence. How many of you ever tried to share the gospel with somebody and you felt when you left, you just felt more like it was just you were on an apology tour for why they should follow Christ? I mean, you just, you stumbled over your words, you didn't know how to, you just had, felt like you had no confidence to express the gospel. How many of you don't share the gospel because you feel like you have, because you have no confidence in doing it? Don't raise your hands, just think. I think a lot of Christian people don't have any confidence in sharing the gospel. Part of that, they don't know what to say. That can be easily remedied through scripture memory. Very simple. 
The other part of it is lacking confidence in the Lord and in what He can do through them. Confidence here, this word, it means an open, frank, which is just, you know, honest, free without any concealment. And I think that that is what people need in this world today. They just need a gracious, respectful, open, confident presentation of the good news about Jesus Christ. I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I've trusted in Him as my Savior. You should too. Let me tell you how. With confidence. Not belligerentness, if that's a word. Not knocking people over the head with your 12-pound study Bible. That's not what I'm talking about. Graciously expressed. Your conversation full of grace and seasoned with salt, as, as Paul will say. But with confidence. This is the truth. This is what is right. This is what you need. You know, there's a, a lot of believers in our culture today, I think, that have an idea that, well, I don't, I don't want to be too forward with the gospel. I just want to kind of live it out so maybe they'll see it in my life and maybe ask me. I don't want to push them away from Jesus, you know, by like confronting them and telling them they need to come and trust Jesus. I'm just going to live it quietly and hope they kind of catch it. Jesus did not say, go into all the nations and live quietly and hope they will catch your example and ask you how they can know this Jesus whom you serve. He did not say that. He said, go into all the world and tell them. Romans 10. How will they believe unless someone tells them? Now this does not mean that there is not a place for our lifestyle to reflect our faith, it, it sure better. Because if it doesn't, we don't have a platform to share. But what it does mean is if there are lost people in my circles of influence and I'm depending on my example and never getting around to words, I am not doing what Jesus told me to do. Paul said, pray that I'll know what to say because I'm saying something. Because people don't get saved by watching other people go to church. They get saved by hearing the good news about Jesus Christ the problem of sin in their life, the remedy that God has provided, and asking Jesus to be their Savior, and I'm responsible to go and tell. That's how people get saved. And so, share it with confidence. Going to people as if you have the answer to life. And we do. We do. We absolutely do. The third thing, he says, pray that I would speak boldly as I ought to speak. With confidence, with boldness. Those two things together should accompany our sharing of the gospel. And so those are the things he asked for prayer right there. To sum all of these passages up, first, the wrong button, all right, we learned this morning, these are some things we can pray for. Pray the gospel will spread quickly. Pray that gospel will be honored and pray for protection and deliverance for those who go to share. Okay? Give thanks while you pray. God, you're going to do something, and I'm thanking you now, because I know it's going to be good. Pray that God would open doors for the gospel. Pray that we will speak boldly, as we should. Pray that God will give us the right words to speak, and we will confidently make the gospel known. That's three different passages where we are told to pray over, the, over missions, over the gospel going forward. Now here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to have our mission team come forward. Okay? I have them gather right down here. And then I'm going to ask as many of you who are willing and able, you don't have to, but come up and let's gather around this team. And I want you to pick at least one of these things and I want you to pray for that because we'll have a time of silent prayer around our team well not silent let's just do this pray out loud if you want and if you want to pray silently pray silently we'll have a time of prayer for our team from some of these things that I have put up here and then um, I will close us out with our prayer time and then we'll go be seated and we'll have our invitation 
That's what I want us to do. By way of review, just so you'll remember, pray that the gospel... Now, as I'm going through this, I want you to pick one. This will be yours that you're going to pray. If you're really ambitious, pick two. <laughs> yeah, there's some, I heard some ambitious laughter out there. All right. The gospel will be spread quickly, that the gospel will be honored. I saw somebody taking pictures with their cell phone. Highly intelligent people follow their example. <laughs> That um, there will be protection, deliverance from harmful, um, unbelieving people. Give thanks while you pray. Pray that God will open doors for the gospel. Pray that we will speak boldly as we should. And that God would give us the right words to speak and that we would confidently make the gospel known. You can pray that for our team. You can pray that for our church body. You can pray that for our brothers and sisters in Honduras. These are all the kinds of prayers God wants to answer. I really believe that. As Paul asked that people would pray these things. So we have it on scriptural authority. All right, so if I can have our mission team, come on down. Let's go. The roast is in the oven, folks. Let's get moving. Come on. <laughs> I'm teasing. Just right down here in the front. All right, as many of you, yeah, right over here in the front. Well, I want the, everybody to be able to get around you guys and gals. All right, as many of you who are willing, come on up and let's gather around our mission team and, uh, and let's pray over them. Whatever one or two things you picked, I'll be down there, yeah. Whatever one or two things you picked, uh, this is your time. Pray it silently, pray it out loud, and we're going to call out to the Lord this morning. Father, we're so grateful that we have the means and the opportunity to go and... and uh, take the good news Father to join in with a body of believers who are already proclaiming that good news in Honduras um, God we pray that you would give us your protection uh, your safety in our travels we pray that you'd protect us from Satan's attacks Father there is always opposition to the gospel that we know from whom it comes Please protect our team from attacks within, Lord. Satan loves to do that. Father, I pray that you would protect Osvaldo and Rosie, their family, the leaders of these churches um, with whom Osvaldo works. Father, the, uh, Lord, that, that the things that you want done in Honduras will get done. And God, I pray that you would give us grace and strength confidence and boldness Lord to go forward as ambassadors of Christ because that's what we are Lord we are in your hands we are your servants God I pray that you'd help us um, to love your son more deeply to have a greater sense of the need for sharing the gospel here in Troy in our, our neighborhoods here in our state our country and around our world until Jesus comes Father, we pray that you would open doors that we don't even know about, but that you long to open. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. From the media team at First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas, we want to say thank you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or want to know how you can experience the love of Christ in your life and family, visit us online at fbctroytx.org and send us a message. Thank you and have a wonderful week.